thought we'd start our program. We always try to make sure we stop our program uh, at 1.15, and uh, I'm committed to doing that today as well. I know you all are very busy. Uh, I did want to uh, introduce Dr. Keith Martin here, um, distinguished guest who was uh, 20 years an MP in the Canadian Parliament and the founder of the Canadian International Conservation Caucus. So, uh, Dr. Martin, if you want to sit up there. This is a, a counterpart we have. Really quick, I will let you know that the ICCF has now expanded to include 34 member countries uh, with under its umbrella. Uh, and a lot of uh, these countries uh, are now beginning, uh, Canada had done it for a long time, but a lot of these countries are now uh, uh, being encouraged and forming on their own, uh, their own kind of congressional caucuses focused on these issues to create dialogue and to create, uh, hopefully in the future, some interparliamentary, especially by um, uh, uh, exchanges between the United States and their parliaments, um, bilateral exchanges. Um, I will introduce our first speaker right now, um, who's Justin Ward uh, with um, Conservation International, who's with their Center, Center for Environment, Leadership, and Business, uh, which has been around for some time and uh, has done a, lo a lot of great work, and I'll let um, Justin talk to you about that. Uh, and here's Justin. Thanks very much, uh, John. <coughs> um, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Conservation International, we are, in addition to being proud, proud uh, partners of the um, ICCF, we are a nonprofit nature conservation organization founded in 1987. Our headquarters are here in the Washington, D.C. area, and we have offices in 40 countries around the world. Our mission is to empower societies to responsibly care for nature for the well-being of humanity. Since Conservation International was founded nearly 25 years ago, our board and executive leadership have believed that harnessing private sector ingenuity is essential to an effective strategy for achieving healthy, sustainable economies and natural ecosystems. The question for us has never been wh whether to engage with the corporate sector, but rather how can we work with companies to promote our mission and at the same time generate business value. So over the years, we have formed partnerships with many leading businesses in key industries, Walmart, McDonald's, Starbucks, Marriott, Shell, Chevron, Weyerhaeuser, and Northrop Grumman, to name just a few. It is my privilege today to introduce two experts who will address how businesses and non-governmental organizations are working together to stop illegal logging, one of the most important threats facing not only the world's tropical forests, but also the core economic interests of U.S. companies dealing with wood and paper products. And, um, and uh, this, also affects, this issue also affects the Canadian context to a great extent. This discussion brings into focus why international conservation benefits America in the form of enhanced U.S. competitiveness, U.S. national security, supply chain efficiencies, and goodwill around the globe. We will hear first from Donna Harmon, who is president and CEO of the American Forest and Paper Association. Throughout the last decade, Conservation International has worked in partnership with with AFNPA on various initiatives related to <coughs> illegal logging, the subject of today's briefing, as well as sustainable forest management. Following Donna, we will have remarks from my colleague, John Musinski, who leads the Geographic Information Systems Laboratory at Conservation International. And John will speak to us about some of the innovative ways that CI is working with partners like AFNPA, like NASA, um, and developing country governments to use technology for improved illegal logging detection and enforcement. So with that, I'll turn the microphone back yes, over to Yes, this is uh, Donna Harmon, um, who is the CEO and president of American Forest and Paper Association, which has been a uh, partner of the ICCF now for many years. And uh, we would like to welcome Donna back. So. Well, thank you all for having me this afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and uh, delighted to have the chance just to talk for a little bit about the partnerships that 
AFMPA has had with CI as well as some of the other work that we've been doing around sustainability and around illegal logging. Uh, we did have a briefing on this a few years ago and um, it's a, a timely topic. A lot's happened since the last briefing that we did and so I'm just um, really pleased to be able to share some updates with you in terms of, of what's happening and what's going on. Did it work? <laughs> I have to point it at something in particular. There you go. Excellent. Great. Thanks. <coughs> so um, just recently, AFMPA and our member companies have agreed to launch a new initiative called Better Practices, Better Planet 2020. This is a, a really a continuation of AFMPA's commitment to sustainability. And I'm starting with sustainability because it, when you talk about illegal logging and the impact of illegal logging, on U.S. businesses and uh, on international conservation, I was really encouraged with some of uh, John's early, earlier comments uh, about the nature of the raw material that we work with. And when people can live and work on the land, earn a living from the land, they're more likely to take better care of the land. That goes back to one of the founding principles, I think, of the forest products industry here in the United States. And if you think about this industry, without a long-term sustainable supply of our raw material, we won't be in business. Many of our companies at AFMPA um, have been in business for over 150 years, and uh, they want to be in business for another 150 years. So making sure that the practices, the business practices that they engage in every day are rooted in and founded in sustainable practices will help to ensure that they are, in fact, here uh, uh, in, in another 150 years. So for us, sustainability uh, really brings together the three legs of the stool. It's the economic, it's the environmental, and it's the social. It's the intersection of those. And when those thi three things intersect, the world is a better place. It's a better place for our employees. It's a better place for the communities where our member companies operate. Uh, and economically, it's obviously better for our country. And environmentally, it's better for the globe. So as those things come together, I wanted to talk to today just about two of the elements. You have a card that the ICCF staff have, um, have handed out for earlier about the AFMPA commitment. But I wanted to talk about two of them in particular. Let's see. The first is um, our recycling goal. I know that's an important issue that people are always interested in knowing. Just how are we doing as a country on recycling? And um, recycling is a great way to uh, improve our natural resource management because uh, the paper that uh, is recycled did in fact come from the forest. And in 2010, the U.S. recovered 63.5% of all of the paper that is consumed in the United States for recycling. And it's amazing how many people are unaware that our recycling rate is that high. So I just wanted to take this moment to um, to, to remind you all of that fact uh, because it does play specifically into uh, one of the other goals that you'll see on the chart uh, for our Sustainability 2020 initiative. And that's really um, related to um, uh, illegal logging, in fact. Um, if you'll notice, one of the um, goals that we have is to increase the amount of fiber procured from certified forest lands or through certified fiber sourcing programs in the U.S and work with governments, industry, and other stakeholders to promote policies around the globe to reduce illegal logging. And so at, when I was asked by um, ICCF and CI to participate in today's forum, I thought that, that that was just a terrific uh, kind of culmination of uh, maybe um, eight or so years worth of work that we've been doing together collectively uh, in, in this partnership. So international conservation does enhance our U.S. competitiveness, and illegal logging um, is really an important part of that. A few years ago, um, we came together with Conservation International, recognizing that there is no silver bullet when it comes to dealing with illegal logging, that it's on-the-ground practices, changing people's behavior on the ground, that really makes a difference. And through this partnership, we've been able to um, work with CI and to provide uh, some uh, funding and working with the State Department uh, with some aerial surveillance technology that you'll hear more about in just a few minutes from John. 
But it's been a very successful initiative because uh, with the aerial surveillance technology, you can actually look at and see when a harvest is occurring. If it's a large harvest and it's a harvest, uh, then the authorities can be notified, can be determined whether or not it's being, um, that, that the harvest is taking place in compliance with or in conformance with the local laws of that particular country. And this is a great place where you really see the intersection of how international conservation helps U.S. companies and improves U.S. competitiveness. Um, the World Bank in 2006 reported that illegal logging costs as much as $15 billion in lost assets and revenue around the world. And for the U.S. forest products industry alone, we estimated a few years ago that it could be as much as between 500 and 700 million dollars in lost product sales annually. So that's really the genesis from which um, our interest in as U.S. manufacturers of paper and wood building materials come together with CI's interest of ensuring that, uh, that international conservation um, is uh, is on the ground, is working, and with IC ICCF's mission of um, poverty alleviation, of uh, protection and conservation of natural resources, and um, the impact then that that has on social stability and on world peace. In addition to uh, the on the ground activities, recognizing that uh, not only do we need you know, really practical common sense solutions, there also is a role for governments to play. And AFMPA has been involved in another partnership called the Forest Legality Alliance, uh, the industry advisory group, which again brings together businesses, uh, government agencies, and some environmental uh, NGOs to the table to work uh, on educational programs and initiatives that take place around the globe. And these educational initiatives help people understand how to comply with the Lacey Act amendments that the Congress passed in 2008. Uh, they do seminars, which again raises the awareness on the ground of the importance of making certain that, uh, that uh, product that's being imported into the U.S. is being imported, um, is coming from legally logged sources. Uh, there's a declaration requirement, and we are working with the Forest Legality Alliance as well as with, the, with our members and with our customers because they're a very important part in the supply chain to make sure that people know how they can uh, have the declarations, how the declarations need to be filled out and how to ensure that they know in their supply chain where their raw material has come from. So the combination of working with governments, working with ENGOs, working in the private sector and through the supply chain can really make a difference in terms of changing the dynamic and changing the structure uh, for uh, on the ground for the local people uh, who are involved in it and are engaged really at the heart, at the, at the heart of the problem uh, where the illegal logging occurs in the first place. Uh, and so uh, I think together and collectively uh, the work that we've done with, that AFMPA has done, uh, with many of you in the room, in fact, many of the congressional offices in the room, along with the ICCF and CI, to raise visibility, to raise awareness around the issue, and really to make the case for why there's an economic and social, uh, as well as environmental, uh, reason for us to be concerned about international conservation and the effect it can have on U.S. competitiveness. So with that, I'll stop and um, ask John to talk more about the partnership. Thanks, Donna. Um, <laughs> we now have John Musinski, um, who is a senior director at Conservation International uh, for Global Change and Ecosystem Services. Uh, as we've talked about before, Conservation International is one of the founding partners of ICCF. Um, after John's talk, I think we'll have uh, some time for some questions, uh, so we can start getting those ready and uh, give it over to John. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I have to say, this is a new one for me. I'm not quite used to this kind of formality. Uh, I usually spend a lot of time in the field where we get dressed up with mosquito repellent and anti-leaf socks and, and the like. Um, in any case, the issue of uh, illegal logging and illegal forestry activity of all kinds is a fundamental one for Conservation International, an organization which is committed to exploring ways that nature can make major contributions as 
Justin mentioned, to human well-being. Illegal logging is often highly destructive to forests, which has economic and social repercussions, not just environmental ones. From the point of view of ecosystem integrity and the benefits that healthy ecosystems provide, illegal logging contributes to declines in biodiversity it, and it exacerbates deforestation, which makes forests less resilient and more vulnerable to fire and other disturbances. Government revenues are affected. This is, I know, something which many of us in this room are particularly concerned with these days. <coughs> and as are people in working in developing countries. And uh, these loss of uh, government revenues uh, has effect of um, lowering the capacities of governments to respond to illegal logging. Uh, illegal logging also has the effect of detracting from investment in better forest governance while simultaneously increasing corruption. It can result in depleted or contaminated water supplies, which is a major focus of our organization these days, and it can deprive local communities of their rights and traditional access to local resources, which is really cri critical to addressing poverty. And perhaps most important, importantly, from the point of view of the United States' interests, it undermines markets for the legal operators and depresses global world wood commodity prices, which lowers profits for American timber companies. So for the past four years, in partnership with the American Forest and Paper Association, Conservation International has worked in conjunction with NASA and host country partners to tackle the problem of illegal logging at the source. We harness satellite remote sensing technology to detect and track illegal logging and fire, which actually serves as the first indicator of deforestation. And strengthening, we focus on strengthening the capacity of government agencies responsible for enforcement. We've developed a suite of near real-time satellite remote sensing systems, monitoring systems, which are designed to trigger rapid response by patrols and other enforcement officials working on the ground. The alerts disseminated by these systems, some of which are displayed here in the slide, present critical information on suspected illegal logging and unplanned illegal forest conversion, which is otherwise known as encroachment. And these alerts have been proved successful in a number of ways. First, they've contributed to increases in the interdiction of illegal logging and uh, loggers and encroachers who are actively pursuing high value timber and also lands, basically forested lands within these globally import important ecosystems. Second, these monitoring tools and decision support tools have led to increased transparency about what's happening where and when and what government agencies are actually doing about it. They've helped to build a deterrence once people recognize that illegal forestry activity can be monitored and they've enabled local communities to more effectively police and manage their own lands. Over 1,000 subscribers receive alerts like these each day. In Sumatra, for example, forest patrols are working to protect montane forest areas due to their importance in mitigating floods, providing clean water to local communities, and serving as long-term stores of carbon. These areas also happen to be the last refugees, refuges of the Sumatran tiger, elephant, and rhinoceros. Unfortunately, they are under severe pressure from illegal loggers and settlers who are frequently supported by financiers looking to capitalize on conversion of empty forest lands to timber, oil palm, and coffee. The illegal activity not only challenges Indonesia's efforts to sustainably develop its economy, but undermines local and international companies engaged in fair trade practices. In response, Conservation International and our network of partners with the support of American Forest and Paper Association and the U.S. Department of State have been coordinating and facilitating joint enforcement activities involving community forest patrols, tiger patrols, and government patrol units utilizing the data from these real, near real-time monitoring systems to identify and respond to new threats as they occur. Of course, this initiative is only one piece of a much larger puzzle. On the supply side, positive economic incentives for adopting sustainable land use practices are absolutely key. And on the demand side, adoption of liability schemes like the 2008 Amendment to the Lacey Act, as well as chain of custody certification systems and green public procurement policies play a critical role. Nevertheless, this initiative has demonstrated how strategic partners between partnerships between industry and conservation groups like ours can make measurable progress, 
possible in the effort to combat illegal logging globally, which has had a direct benefit to the American economy and U.S. competitiveness. Thank you. Okay, we're actually doing pretty well on time. So um, it's just after one o'clock, so we've got some time for uh, some questions or discussion um, from some of our speakers. Uh, I don't know if anybody's got some questions uh, right off the bat. Um, maybe we'll just bring uh, our speakers up here as they might want to address them or address all of them. Um, does anybody have any questions? Got one here in the back here. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the microphone. If you could answer the questions, I guess probably on that microphone as well. Tristan Brown with Senator Klobuchar's office. I'm curious what, what's Congress's role in, in, in helping address this problem? Well, I think that uh, awareness is really an important piece of the component. Um, th additionally, there are obviously a number of different uh, programs, and I don't think any of us are here uh, today on behalf of ICCF to, to endorse a specific um, item or a specific agenda. But as the Congress is looking at international conservation efforts, there are a number of different funding issues that, that come into play. Uh, but there also is just the awareness that what happens globally does in fact affect U the U U.S. businesses as it affects the planet. And so I think one of the purposes of today's briefing was to give you an example of something that's um, on the ground that's happening uh, that is the result of a public-private partnership um, because obviously the government does have some involvement with the NASA uh, surveillance. Um, and I know when we first began this partnership, it began out of an initiative with the State Department. So, John, I don't know if you have more that you'd like to offer as to what um, you think Congress can do. Well, we are more of an educational body here. I think uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of our partners. There are a lot of U.S. government uh, agencies uh, right now that are working on illegal logging uh, with the Fish U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We've got Val Mazinus here, who's in head of their international programs. Thank Val. <laughs> Uh, there you are, <laughs> uh, and who's working a lot on this. But I think um, uh, the first thing, obviously, is to uh, uh, get a good uh, education um, on what is uh, happening in these areas and uh, looking at a lot of our partners, as I mentioned earlier, uh, talking to Global Environment Facility, talking to uh, American Forest and Paper Association, Conservation International. Um, those are the people that are working out in the field. Those are the people that uh, are responsible for creating jobs in America. Those are the people that are, we hope, uh, going to have uh, large profits and be successful in the field. So that's who I would concentrate on uh, really talking to when you get down to specific uh, questions on policy. And, you know, people here, you know, we don't all pretend to agree on everything, but what we do uh, agree on is that these issues are important, that they're linked, uh, and they're in the U.S. national interest. So that would be uh, my response to that question. Okay. Val, would you like to say something? Uh, just to uh, ask Donna on the uh, Lacey Act, probably uh, how supportive are your, uh, are, is your membership uh, on the Lacey Act? By the way, I'm with the uh, Forest Service. I like the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I set the record straight. <laughs> uh, AFMPA is very supportive of uh, the Lacey Act amendments, and we would like to see, the, it, to, to see it be fully implemented. Uh, we've worked as uh, part of a coalition, a broad-based coalition, actually, that included some businesses, some ENGOs, another example of, of partnerships to, uh, to actually get the Lacey Act amendments approved uh, back in 2008. Now we're working on the implementation of the Lacey Act, and we want to make sure that as the Lacey Act is, is implemented, it's done in a way that works for businesses, that the rules are clear, that um, it's not overly burdensome, it's not overly uh, cumbersome, but it's done in a way that actually um, is demonstrating, you know, the, the benefits of the rule of law. Um, because the more that you begin to get a sense of certainty and that the, that the law is being enforced, the deterrent effect will be there for illegal logging and for product. Um, you know, I think as John mentioned and as I mentioned in my remarks as well, what we're really trying to stop is an economic incentive for people to engage in illegal logging in the first place. Then the Lacey Act is one way that we can do that. 
Okay, we've got uh, from Janine Benner here. Thanks. Um, I work for Congressman Blumenauer, and just following up on the question about the Lacey Act, Donna, can you talk a little bit about the funding uh, for that? And, and I think there's potentially a role for Congress there. I understand if you don't want to push a particular agenda here, but um, is there anything you'd like to say about um, funding for implementation and how that might help make sure the process works well for business and others? Well, I think people are concerned that with the government um, focused on budget cuts and the need to get the fiscal house in order that some of these types of programs that might not be as well known, you know, could end up on the chopping block. And so it certainly as uh, Congress is looking to the FY12 uh, appropriations process, that's a, that's a place that I would just encourage everybody to look at um, this particular program and the, and the various um, funding requests that are obviously out there. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Did we have time for one or two more? I'm Jeanette with Senator Udall's office. <coughs> Sorry. My question's for John. I was wondering if you could describe a little bit more um, the, the mapping that you do in communities and, and how that process works. I think that there's some, I know you, that you guys go out and do training sessions and stuff, but if you could talk a little bit more about um, maybe give an example of one of the mapping projects in Indonesia or something. Sure, we do, uh, well, there are all many different types of uh, mapping that uh, organization engages in um, from kind of global setting of priorities, identifying the kind of the critical areas uh, to focus our work um, to, in, in this case, we're, we're, we do training with local uh, um, government officials, non-government organization um, representatives, and actually the patrols, the tiger patrols, rhino patrols, and the forest patrols that the government has to engage in utilization of these data and um, improve their actual enforcement uh, activities. And so we, we just can't had a uh, training session in Lampung um, in southern Sumatra in uh, March. Very successful training which involved about uh, 30 odd people from different provincial government representatives and, and NGOs and the like. And they, they basically, part of it is a train the trainer approach so they go out and do additional training on their own and, and part of it is, is um, kind of bringing them up to speed on the technical, the technologies, uh, how they can better use these technologies both uh, to report to their superiors on, on what's going on and also to go out in the field and engage in, in um, enforcement activities. And, um, and then there are many other types of trainings that are, are taking take place as well. Okay, do we have any more questions? <coughs> so we have kind of an overflow crowd today. Sorry about that, thanks for everybody for coming. Just before we leave, I'm going to do something a little bit dangerous. I got I want to thank a few people that are here, though, uh, which is the ICC co-chair staff. So it's the staff working in our uh, co-chair offices on the Hill. Uh, Pete Modaff is here with Norm Dix. Um, Ryan Showers is here with Norm Dix. Uh, Victoria Luck is here with uh, Hal Rogers. Um, Jennifer Prather is right there with Ben Chandler. Um, we've got Hunter Strupp here, uh, who's uh, moved on to the committee, but still very much helping us with our issues in uh, Ed Royce's office. Um, in Portman's office, we have uh, Kate Van Buskirk uh, here, and we also have Jeanette Lyman with Tom Udall, and I think, did I miss anybody? Anyway, go, oh, Patrick. Oh, sorry, Patrick, <laughs> sorry, Patrick Woodcock from uh, Senator Snow's office. Apologize, I didn't see there. Um, these are, uh, uh, our co-chair staff, um, there are obviously some other uh, members' uh, offices not represented here. Um, these are some of uh, the people you should go talk to about more information about joining the caucus and even some of the issues. Uh, they do a lot of, uh, have done a lot of great work and we sure uh, appreciate all their uh, support and efforts over the years. Um, anyway, thank you very much for coming. Uh, very much look forward to seeing you at the next briefing soon. Dessert is still coming. We 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 have not. We've got uh, another, I think five six minutes uh, till one fifteen. So, <laughs> hopefully it'll come by then. But you can stay as long as you want. We just try to make sure we stop these programs because we know you guys are very busy and we don't want to just 
keep you guys here. So dessert and coffee, it looks like they're bringing in right now. I think it looks like a good creme brulee. Anyway, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>